sorry he can't be here, but of course in ReChange you have Yuri Manin who arrived, <laughs> and I'm very glad you're, you're now here. You thought that perhaps that this is planned that I talk about the Manin conjecture today, but that's purely coincidental. <laughs> So what I'll do today is I'll start, we have made all kinds of preparations. I'm very grateful to Ching Li for doing a lot about Yudinim modules because that saves me a lot of time and energy. I'm grateful that the theory of displays has been completely discussed so I can use that. And today we really start rolling up our sleeves and starting the proof. Now first I want to comment on the proof. If you have something like the Grobny conjecture, so what's the Grobny conjecture? You take the closed fiber, you take a Newton polygon lying below the Newton polygon with a closed fiber, and you want to construct a family which realizes this new Newton polygon. Now, of course, there's an obvious way to start. Namely, what you do, you take the closed fiber, you write out the full deformation theory, and now with your hands, you feel all fibers in the deformation, what Newton polygons you've got. And if the Newton polygon you want is there, you're happy. And if it is not there, the conjecture is wrong. Now there's one little catch in this. Namely, these fibers are over this base, so are over non-perfect fields. And although the definition of a Newton polygon is quite straightforward, Computing the Newton polygon is extremely difficult, especially over non-perfect fields. So if you take one of these fibers, they may be defined over some large transcendental extension in some form of completion and so on and so on. And there the p-divisible group is really difficult to describe, leave alone to describe this, uh, this, um, this Newton polygon of, this, uh, of all these fibers. So we've been struggling quite a long time to do the following, build a big machine, feed in the Grobny conjecture in front and see what comes out. And nothing came out for a long, long period of time. And why, I've just explained to you. And I was working on this for a long time and now in retrospect, I think I owe David Mumford uh, an ID in a completely different situation, namely lifting a beam variety to characteristic zero. And I'll explain it in one minute because that's very useful for the proof of today and tomorrow and Friday. You take the beam variety characteristic P, you want to show it can be lifted. And there again, you have a deformation theory and you want to see whether it has a characteristic zero fiber and you get stuck. And then David Mumford came and said, well, what you have to do, you first take your beam variety in characteristic P and you deform it in characteristic P to something you know which can be lifted. And ordinary beam varieties, that these are just the theory of set H coordinates and canonical lifts, can be lifted. So you reduce your problem to a characteristic P problem of deforming your beam variety in characteristic P to an ordinary one. But that's a rather ad hoc thing. And Pete Norman and I finally carried out this, this, this Mumford program and it's, uh, it's uh, difficult paper and it's one of the most difficult computations I think I did because there you really have to make a non-canonical choice of some deformation. And so it's completely not functorial automatic, there's no big machine. Okay, so now in my proof here of the Grodny conjecture, there are two steps. And the second step is the machine. Trying, uh, uh, really proving the Grodny conjecture in a special case. And the magic word will be that the A number is at most one. And I'll explain that. So that's today. Today we do the nice case. And then tomorrow I'll show you how to go to the nice case. So if you want to have a picture of basically what we are doing in our proof is, is the following. Here is, say, the Newton polygon stratum to some uh, gamma. And here's the Newton polygon strata of beta, and I'll soon explain. But this Newton polygon stratum may have a horrible singularity. 
Right? And now, suppose you have a point here, you can't see it in the back, even not in the front. It's a very small point there, but it's in the singularity. Now, the deformation theory of this point is terrible. It's, it's highly singular obstructed, and how do you ever see it has a good thing? So, the proof consists of two things. First of all, you deform inside the regular locus of your Nutterballigan stratum. So that will be tomorrow. So, so, so this is tomorrow. And now here, you know that this stratum is nice and smooth, and then you deform going outside, and that's today. And then on Friday, I'll show you how to patch together things and draw conclusions. So today we have the easy case uh, deforming out of the smooth part. Tomorrow we have the more difficult part moving from the singularity to the inside and then just patching things together will really tell you everything. Okay, so before I move on, I will tell you one conjecture which I will prove today Namely, please remember that he proved the duality theory for, 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 for being varieties. And from that you conclude that the Newton polygon is, is symmetric. So let me sketch you this proof. I have an abelian variety. I take its Newton polygon. And I want to show it is symmetric. Symmetric means that the Newton polygon equals slopes beta 1 to beta h, the rational numbers. And symmetric means that if you take 1 minus beta h up to 1 minus beta 1, so you take exactly the same slopes, but you subtract them from 1, then you get exactly the same. And if these are ordered in a non decreasing order, the same holds, of course, for this. So that's the definition of, of symmetric. Now, what is the proof? First of all, I proved for you that if you take the p-divisible group of the dual of a beam variety, then this is canonically isomorphic to the p-divisible group of your beam variety, serial dual. And as I said, uh, it looks innocent, but <laughs> it's not completely obvious. Manning proved this in his thesis, 1963, over a finite field, and later it was proved in, 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 in quite generality. Then, Ching Li discussed with you a p-divisible group GMN. That's a p-divisible group of dimension M of height M plus N, and which is simple and which is isoclinic of slope. And what you easily show, that if you take the ser dual of this, well, what else can it be? I mean, the dual has dimension n, and the height is still this, so this you prove. And actually, this is already over fp. Now, this one you prove easily if you use the duality, you look into the thesis by Tadao Oda in 1966, and you will already find this material. And let me basically explain you why this is true. What is the DNA module of this? This is a free W module on which F and V act. Now, if you dualize, then you get a free uh, Jirinay module, there is a free, free W module, which is a Jirinay module of, of its dual. And under duality, the F and M are interchanged. Now remember, this was given by an equation, <laughs> V to the N minus F to the M, right? Uh, it is V to the N minus uh, F to the N. And if V and F interchange, you just get the opposite thing. So morally, this is completely correct, and you just have to write out all the details <laughs> of that proof. But this is but it's easy, okay? And now you're done, because moreover, there is an isogeny from A to AT, right? And now this, 
these three things are proof of proof, well, of course, to approve the whole thing. Because this says that the p divisible group of A and the p divisible group of AT is the same Newton polygon on the one hand. On the other hand, you dualize the Newton polygon, that means you go to the dual p divisible group, but the dual p divisible group, as soon as the GMN <laughs> appears here, the GNM appears here. So the GMN and the GNM appear as the same multiplicity, and that's the proof. Okay, and now the conjecture. The Mannian conjecture is the following. Suppose, conversely, you do have a symmetric Newton polygon. You fix a prime number, which will be your characteristic. Does there exist a field in characteristic P such that there exists an immediate variety, which is that Newton polygon? And I must tell you a little story I was in Harvard, 66, 67, and John Tate got a letter from Jean Pierre Serre, and Tate showed it to me. And the letter said, well, I've proved the money conjecture. And he explained how to prove the money conjecture. But as I have not much news to tell you, I just end my letter here. <laughs> and that was something people were really looking for a long time. Now, I hope to have time at the end of my talk to to show you two proofs. One is by Honda Tate theory, and I'll tell you how to do it in the notes. And one is uh, a corollary of the theory we are, we are going to develop today. And you already see what's coming. We are really going to deform uh, p divisible groups. And if you know a p divisible group is a very small Newton polygon, so a very high up. And you have enough deformation theory, and if you would know the Grothian conjecture, then of course the Mani conjecture would follow. Because you can realize every Newton polygon in, in the family. So there it is. Yes? Okay. Uh, I like to start doing the things I have to do. And um, I will start giving you a definition. Everything is in the notes. But this is really uh, important. So uh, I want you, I want you to define the A number. Okay, so that's in five four. I have any group scheme in characteristic P, but let's do it for an abelian right, It doesn't matter. And this is over a field K. And I want to define you the number AK, AA. And for that, I choose a perfect extension and I take alpha P. Remember, alpha P means alpha P over any base scheme. So here it is alpha P over L. I harm it into A, and this is of course over L now, sorry, AL, and I study this, this group. Of course, this group is a right module under the endomorphisms <coughs> of alpha PL, and it's easily shown that this is isomorphic to your field L. I mean, you can multiply on the tangent space with any constant, and that defines you an endomorphism of your, of your alpha P. So this is a right module under N that we usually call a vector space, and I can take the dimension, and that is uh, the A number. So colloquially, A number is the number of alpha P's you can stick inside your European variety. Please note that you have to go to the perfection. If you don't do, it may be that the dimension of K of alpha P A is different from the dimension of alpha P A L. There's a little slip in the lecture notes of Kizang Lee and myself. We defined it without going to the perfection, but uh, in the notes I have written a counterexample to, the, to that definition. Now, an easy remark. And that I could give you as an exercise, right? Um, 
Suppose k perfect. And to A, you can associate uh, the Dirichlet module of its p divisible group. Right? And it might happen that the A number of A is 1. And I claim this is the same as saying that um, the if you take the local, yeah, how do we do that? If I take the local local part of this, and I take this, it's generated by one element. And of course, the exercise is clear. If you take this module, and you divide by the submodule generated by fm and, 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 and then by vm, you get a vector space you easily prove that that vector space is, is, is canonically this hum, so that's what it proves. If that vector space is one dimensional, then you have a non-commutative Nakayama to prove that your module is generated by one element. And I make, like to make another remark. Um, I mean, um, we, you, you can discuss a finite group scheme over uh, K, which is perfect, right? And this finite group scheme, say it is P power rank, <coughs> is canonically isomorphic to its uh, etal local part, its local local part, and its local etal part. So how do you find the etal and the local part? Well, that's just what you need is you take the connected component of the identity and the quotient is just the etal part. And then you can dualize and on the yeah, on the Cartier dual you can do exactly the same thing. And so local local means that the group scheme is a local group scheme and also its dual is a, is, is, is a local one. Now an example here is mu is mu p because that's uh, sorry eta local I should write my things better eta local that's f not p and here is local eta that's mu p and this is alpha p and if the base field is is perfect you have a direct sum and the essence of set eight coordinates is that for non-perfect fields not necessarily so and that's exactly that beautiful exercise Ching Li gave you two days ago, <laughs> at the end, computing this X group, where Z mod P is in the co-kernel and mu P is in, in, in the kernel. And that X is non-zero for non-perfect fields, but for perfect fields, it's, uh, it's split. Okay, so local local means this, right? And uh, the remark is that N local local is non-zero if and only if hom alpha P and it's not zero. And the n local local is just a tower <laughs> of extensions of uh, of quotient alpha p if you work over an algebraically closed field. Okay, now the basic thing about the whole theory theory I'm I'm, I'm going to tell you today is the following. If you have a p-divisible group over a base, mind everything is in characteristic p. So S is a scheme over spec fp. And Z as a Newton polygon, then we define script w zeta of S as a set of all points such that the Newton polygon is equal or lying above zeta. This sign means it's either equal or lying above. I mean, no points are below zeta, right? And the W open zeta of S, so this is a sign for open, is just the points where you have exactly equality. 
And Grothendieck proved that neutral polygons go up under specialization. And Nick Katz proved that theorem again by working out the proof by Grothendieck in much more precise form, namely saying that W zeta S in S is closed. And I discussed yesterday with you that this is not a representable functor and so on and so on. And if anyone has a good scheme structure a priori on these Ws, I would be extremely happy, but it seems a hard problem. Okay, now let me make one remark, and that remark will be very essential tomorrow. How do you prove that this is closed? So let me spend hand waving and one minute on it. What you do is you take over your base something which you call the crystal of X. It's a kind of DNA module with a much better contact which works over any base. And then you take exterior powers of your crystal and then you take all neutral polygons of all these exterior powers. Now remember, what are you doing if you take a matrix and you take its first exterior power? What are the eigenvalues? They are just products of two eigenvalues of the, of the preceding one. And the triple one is product of three eigenvalues, right? And then you can localize, you, you, you can find the points where the smallest eigenvalue of that operator uh, jumps or doesn't jump. Now if you do all the exterior powers, you get all products, finite products of eigenvalues, and then you take the periodic values. So that's basically the proof of this, right? So what you do, you take such an exterior power, you, you, you represent Frenius or Verschiebung on that crystal, and you look at its uh, uh, smaller slope. How do you detect the smaller slope? by exactly describing the periodic values of all the entries. So what are the defining equations of here? Defining equations are the following. You take all exterior powers of F on your crystal and you put conditions on the smallest slope. So you put conditions on the periodic values of all the entries. So the number of equations is something like uh, you take all entries and all exterior powers of Frobenius <laughs> And then you have a lot, a lot of equations on whether certain elements in weak vectors are zero or not. So the number of equations of this is enormous. And please remember that tomorrow, because tomorrow I will say exactly the opposite. So that's philosophically one, uh, one very good point. Now I would comment on this thing a little bit. Namely, what I have defined for you, suppose, um, what do I want, zeta and beta? <coughs> Doesn't matter so much. Uh, let gamma be preceding beta, right? Then, from my definition, it's clear that if you take this, that this contains W gamma S. Right? Just, just the definition. Here you take all fibers which have neutral polygon beta or above. Now there's the certainly is in there, so this in there, right? And you could also take the open part where beta exactly is realized, and you could take this risky closure of this. Now, this is closed, and this is closed, right? And this is the closure of this. So this certainly is, um, how do I say? So the question is, is W gamma S contained in W beta open S risky? You see, in defining this W zeta S, I could do two things. I could either take the definition as it stands, 
or I could take the definition, take W zeta open and close it up. Do I get the same thing? And I'll give you an example where the answer is no in general. So that's the subtlety in the whole notation which you should pay attention to, but, uh, but, but it doesn't matter so very much. Time is running fast. I want to make one more remark. In my whole theory today, I will discuss the non-polarized case. But um, there is also a generalization of the Grotny conjecture to, yeah, to a polarized version. If you have a polarized version, then automatically the Newton polygon is symmetric. And the generalized version indeed is correct for principal polarizations. So if the polarization is principal, the obvious way of asking growth and deconjecture does hold. But I'll give you an example that the generalization of growth and deconjecture for polarized to be in varieties so for polarized p-divisible groups is not true if the polarization is not principal. And I'll give you a counterexample for that. So there's this subtlety in the whole, 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 whole theory. But it gives you a lot of information how Newton polygon strata are nested in the, in the moduli space. Okay, so now I really have to go to work, and I apologize for this blackboard. Apologies because uh, this theory is not in the notes. And we should have incorporated it, but uh, we didn't do it. Uh, it is in the two papers which are uh, cited in my notes. And uh, it is certainly corollary, corollary of all the theory which was developed on this place. So let me go back in history. To my knowledge, David Mumford was the first who described this place. And what do you... And what is a display and why do you like it? Or are you going to like it? Um, you do Schlesinger deformation theory. So what do you do? You take some object, be p divisible group, be variety, or whatever, and you lift it to local item rings, and you keep lifting, and that defines your functor, gives you a representable functor, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now suppose you want to prove something. First of all, you want to prove that something is liftable. You do this lifting, and all of, all of a sudden, you get stuck somewhere at some level. Does it mean it's not liftable, or do you have to backtrack a few steps and then take another lifting? And that's very difficult. And that's one of the main difficulties of the whole deformation theory, first of all. Second of all, you know this functor is pro-representable, but how do you describe the generic fiber? How do you describe any properties of that? Abstractly. You really know a lot about it. For example, that beautiful theory which uh, Ching Li told us how the automorphism group of this closed fiber acts on that deformation space is beautiful, right? But to make explicit computation, to roll up your sleeves and really do a computation, that's hard. And for that purpose, Mumford found a beautiful way of doing it. So here is Mumford's idea worked out later in full generality and now proven in really the generality we, we would like to. This is a simple case. I take the JDNA module of a p-divisible group. That p-divisible group is arbitrary. And I think the, the field is perfect, but if you want to think of algebraically close, that's, 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 that's okay. And I suppose uh, the x zero is local local. So that was a nil potency condition which uh, in Bill Messing's lecture showed up all the time. So this is far away from ordinary, right? You've thrown away the mu p part, you've thrown away the z mod, the q p mod z p part, you've thrown away all that, but you only are interested in, in, in the local local part. And now Mumford's idea was to give an explicit uh, matrix for Frobenius and deform that matrix. Now why does it work philosophically? If you deform matrix, 
still divides P in the sense that that matrix multiplied something else is P. Then that matrix, if you tensor it up to the field of fractions and then to the perfection, gives you some matrix and the Verschiebung you define by just dividing P by that matrix. So on that perfection, you get a matrix for Frobenius, you get a matrix for Verschiebung. So by the theory of P divisible groups, you do get a P divisible group over the perfection of the fraction field. And now the whole theory you have to prove is that that P divisible group can be descended then first to the fraction field and then to this ring. And that's a lot of theory and that's difficult. But the idea is completely obvious. Right? So the theory of this place is you just take a matrix, you perturb the matrix to speak a non, non, a non pure mathematical language, and then you get a new matrix and you claim that that matrix is the matrix of Frobenius of a P divisible group over, over some ring. Okay, so here's the theory. You take a kind of hard theoretic filtration, yeah? You take a basis for Vm and you complete it to a basis for the whole module. And you describe you made you, you, your F on your basis. Now please mind that if I take F of one of these vectors, that's an image of V, so that's an F of an image of V, so it's F times V times something, so that's divisible by P, right? And that's the reason why uh, these matrices, well, they are in the V image, so, so, so that's what's written. So the display of Mumford is just you write out F on this basis. A little remark on notation. Um, the F of your P divisible group, <coughs> by covariant theory, becomes V on the module. And the V on your module becomes F, and the, the V on your P divisible group becomes F. So I have the habit of writing script F on the module, which is a Frobenius, but which of course is MP of V. And this you should put in quotes because uh, this is a sigma linear map and the V is a map from XP to X. So that's a morphism and F is not a homomorphism but it's uh, of the linear model but, 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 but it's uh, but it's sigma linear. Okay, so you just write out the matrix of F on, on this basis. Now that seems a very nasty thing to do, but I will assure you that this really gives everything you want. Okay, so first part of the theory, and the conclusion is here. I take any complete local ring in characteristic P with residue class field K, and I take elements in the maximal ideal and I take the Teichmüller lifts of these elements to this, uh, to this V ring. So these are just elements in the maximal ideal and these are Teichmüller lifts. And we're going to apply it in two ways. One is that we choose a ring R and we choose Tij and the other is that we take the Tij variables and this will be the formal power series ring on, on all these variables and the two cases are going to be used. This matrix is, is just rectangular. The size here is H and the size here is, uh, is C. But this is the best way to, uh, to number these things. Now this F I write as a matrix ACBP where this just is block matrices according to uh, this block and this block, right? So, this is, uh, so these are four block matrices. And if I do my homework correctly, you can really multiply T by, by C and by D and get this new matrix. Now what you have to prove, right, that this, is, uh, that this defines a display. So now you have a pair of two things. You have your ring R and you have this matrix which is later postulated to be the matrix of Frobenius, 
And now from this, you have to go to this quadruple uh, studied by Link and discussed by Bill Messing in, 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 in Langston. And of course, the main point is that this really divides P, and that you have to do. And I'm not going to do that for you. Okay, so the claim is that the, the claim is that R plus this, this, this matrix defines a display. Now, from the theory of displays, it says that a display corresponds to a p-divisible group ov over, over this formal spectrum, whose matrix is this. Let me make one remark um, which confused me for a long time. Uh, here I write a formal spectrum, but sometimes people write a spectrum. And there's a paper by Johan de Jong, the references are exactly in the notes, which says that if you take a p-divisible group, which is a formal p-divisible group over a formal spectrum, then it comes from a p-divisible group over the spectrum of that ring. And this, of course, is not at all true for, yeah, for, for, for being varieties. I mean, you're not saying that any complex analytic space <laughs> is really algebraic. Right? If you deform, if you take the full set of eight coordinates for, as, as described by Ching Mi yesterday, of G squared full set eight coordinates, the generic fiber of that is a formal abelian scheme over a formal ring, but certainly not algebraizable. But uh, p divisible groups are always quotation marks algebraizable. But I just wrote the formal spectrum. Okay, now if you do this, the whole theory in my notes, and I'm certainly not, don't, don't have time to really discuss all, all, all the details, is, is the following. Suppose you take these T, at TIs, and you take your root polygon uh, picture, right, and you write your matrices uh, in this way in your, yeah, in your picture, right? Why not? I mean, I'm allowed to do that. And suppose you have just some looping polyton gamma. What did I call it beta? No, I want to call it beta. Okay, now the proof which is completely in the notes, is the following. Suppose you take the following innocent thing. For beta, you define the parallelogram of beta. What is it? It's all the lattice points in my parallelogram. So this is the Newton polygon rho, the ordinary one. And I take all lattice points in this parallelogram, which are on or above beta. So the ones here are forbidden, but the ones on the Newton polygon are okay, the ones in the interior are okay, and the ones here are forbidden. Now, just do a mental exercise. You know the Feynman principle? The Feynman principle is you should have one example in mind, and if any formula is wrong in that example, then the whole theory is wrong. Okay, so here is the example. You know that if you take rho, right, what is the deformation space of all deformations? It is just d times c. It is just the dimension times the dimension of the dual, right? And, and that we'll use tomorrow, and that has been proved uh, by Ching Mi, and it's proved in the notes. And so the exercise is just take all lattice points which are on rho or above rho, but not on this prove that these are exactly d times c, but that's obvious, right? So now the theorem says, take this uh, parallelogram of beta, so that all the points in this, all the lattice points in this region, possibly on the new polygon, but not on the thing above. Then I can form the following ring. I take r beta, I take all lattice points in this parallelogram, I take formal variables, 
and inform me and join them to my, to my base field. This is a formal uh, power series ring on how many variables, the number of variables, is exactly the lattice points in beta, in final beta, in the final beta, and this I baptized the dimension of beta. So the dimension of beta is just a purely combinatorial, easy object. So this is, so this is obvious, right? It is, it's just notation. And now comes the theorem. The theorem says that if I start with a closed fiber where the A number is at most one, then I can take the beta notopolygon stratum in this deformation space, and that is, well, it's canonically isomorphic to the formal spectrum of beta. So if you accept this theorem, I really prove for you what I said before, namely that as soon as the A number is at most one, all the notopolygon strata containing that point, locally at that point, are really regular, really smooth over your base field. And they're nested exactly like, like they do. I mean, if you go up with your notopolygon by deleting this point but taking a little bit higher, the co-dimension is one, which, and, and, and the defining equation is just given by this variable, and so on, and so on, and so on, right? So this really proves, uh, <coughs> proves the dimension formula. Okay, now, I'm not going to give you the proof of this, but the proof is in the notes and is really very easy. Namely, the proof in the notes is as follows. So I'll spend two minutes on it, and then I move on to two to more interesting things. If this <coughs> daily name module is generated by one element, I can normalize my coordinates in a very obvious way. Namely, I can take this for the generator, then E2, the Frobenius of the generator, for E3, the Frobenius squared, and so on. And then this matrix really simplifies a lot. Now you all know the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. The Cayley-Hamilton theorem says that if you take a matrix over a commutative ring, mind commutative, you take its characteristic polynomial, that's a polynomial over your, over your base ring, and you substitute formally in the variable your matrix, you get a square matrix, right? And the Cayley Hamilton theorem says that this is zero. Now, in the proof, in, in the notes, I've, I've, I've given two proofs. And if you ever teach a class in linear algebra, these proofs are really fantastic. One uses Zariski topology, and one uses very easy things. Uh, and if you notice know the topology proof, uh, the other proof is much more digestible. So, the Cayley Hamilton theorem is, is really quite okay. Now, what I would like to have is a Cayley-Hamilton theorem in this case. <laughs> Namely, Frobenius operates in a certain way on E1 in this matrix form, right? And, and you can see how it works. I mean, this matrix is completely explicit. This is sub-diagonal, and then there are all kinds of entries uh, elsewhere, <laughs> right? And then you can try to compute whether F satisfies a certain Cayley Hamilton equation. That is, if there's a linear uh, combination of the F power I, which annihilates the first element. And if you believe Cayley Hamilton over non commutative ring, this is obvious. What you have to do, you just write out the characteristic polynomial and you substitute F in there. Now, of course, there's a little catch, which is a big, big catch. Namely, f is only sigma linear on the, on the coefficient. So you have to say whether f is on the right-hand side of all your variables, or, or coefficients, or you're on the left-hand side, first of all. Second of all, if I take, instead of E1, I take a multiple of E1, and I take some combination of powers of f which annihilates E1, there's no reason it annihilates that multiple. <laughs> because that multiple, that lambda which you put in front, 
to all powers of f get raised to the lambda to the power of sigma to the i, and, and you get a complete mess. Okay, so now the claim is that does exist under the condition that the a number is one, that does exist a polynomial of degree h in f, which coefficients in wr, which really annihilates the first element. So the new Dirne module is something like the Dirne ring modulo this relation. And now you're happy because now you exactly know how to compute the Newton polygon of that. I mean, that's, that's just factoring this, this polynomial over some extension and so on and so on. Okay, so that works for A number one and that proves the theorem. Now, I'm not going to, to, to spell out the details <coughs> because that would really take a long time. <clears throat> and instead, I want to, to give you one example and to prove the money conjecture. So, just a few words, um, quotation mark, the old proof, the proof which Sarah had in mind and which was completely worked out by Humble, by Tate, in, uh, of proving the money conjecture. So, I just quote from, where is it? Um, 3.15 and 3.13, so in the notes you have to go back to, to 3.15 and 3.15, the following, you take integers which are relatively prime, and I want to prove the money conjecture for the Newton polygon given by uh, these pairs. So uh, here, the, the height is 2j, where g is m plus n. And uh, this is a symmetric Newton polygon, and we want to prove it for this. Suppose we had done this, then of course you're, you're okay, because any Newton polygon can be is, which is symmetric can be written as such pairs plus the one once. But the one one is the Newton polygon of a super single elliptic curve. So then the a beam variety you're looking for is just realized by a product of such a beam varieties and super single elliptic curves. Okay, so you want to do this. And what you do, you write down a, a, a polynomial. You take T squared you take p to the n t, where n is the smallest, mind, plus p to the power g, where g is the sum of the smallest n and, 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 and the biggest, and p to the g we baptize q, right? And now it's obvious that, uh, that zero of this polynomial is complex, yeah? Of course, because the discriminant is uh, b squared minus 4c is p 2n minus 4 p to the g, but mine g is, is m plus n, so p n squared is smaller than, even smaller than p, p g squared, so, so this is complex. Okay, now you know that pi, pi conjugate in the complex numbers, that this is Q. Yeah? So you have constructed a very Q number. And now Honda Tate 
implies, so that's 313, that there does exist a Riemann variety over FQ such that the Frobenius of this is conjugate to pi. Yeah? So what is the Frobenius? The Frobenius of A, of A is just F times F at G times. And this is a bad notation. It is A mapping to AP, and then AP mapping to AP squared. So here I should write F, then F, uh, A, this is F, A, P, and so on. Right? Now this is an anamorphism. It sits in the B variety, so has, uh, so has, uh, so it's an algebraic number, and that number is conjugate to this. So that's the theorem by, by Honda and Ted, right? That's the difficult part. And now comes the easy part, and I give you that as an exercise. Exercise. Show that the neutral polygon of this A is xi, which is mn plus n, mm. And mind that you know exactly what the periodic value of A are. And A is just a Frobenius, the geometric Frobenius on your being right, and you just move on. Right? And you know, King Lee has explained to you how the GMN and the GNM, how Frobenius operates there, so you just do it. Right? So this is the proof of the mining conjecture, 1967, by Sarah and by Honda and by Tate. Now we give a complete new proof, which you find in, what is it, in, uh, in 5.19. And the trick is, you start with the following fact, given P and G, there does exist and a beam variety such that the neutral polygon of B0 is sigma, it adds super singular. And the A number of B0 equals one. Now, I indicate in the notes two proofs. One proof is, is a reference to the lecture notes of Casing Lee and myself, we prove that in fact any generic point of any component of the supersingular locus has A number one. But uh, on Friday I will prove this fact again for you <laughs> uh, using uh, deformations of uh, filtered P divisible groups and so on and so on. Okay, so there are two proofs uh, at least for this and you and you them. Okay, but now I'm very happy because what I do is I take the deformation space of B0, right? And you know exactly which neutral polygons appear here. Namely, um, you take the picture which we had before, right? You take the parallelogram and you take all the deformation space, so what you do is here is my sigma, right? Here is my deformation space, and here is my uh, what I want, xi, right? Now the polarized version is slightly different. The polarized version says that your matrix is symmetric, and you really have to take all points on this. So now I take the triangle of xi which is exactly at the points uh, x, y in the parallelogram of psi, such moreover that uh, the x coordinate is at, is at mod g. And the symmetry conditions, ah, sorry, I, um, and b is principally polarized. And it's a principal polarization. B0. That's, that's, that's very important. Okay, now a variant of the theorem which I have there 
which are completely written out in my notes, is that in this deformation space, the locus which you get by W psi is exactly given as is before in such a deformation ring. And actually, it is exactly the dimension of the number of integral points indicated here. And all these neutral polygon strata are nested exactly as neutral polygons uh, are nested by, uh, by inclusion. OK, so that proves that um, I take W xi open. that this is not empty because all multiple polygons above are lower dimensional and a finite number. So I throw out a finite number of uh, uh, lower dimensional subspace and I still get something. And this gives another proof of the mining conjecture. Now let me comment, let me make two comments. First of all, it looks like that this proof, so this is the first proof, that this proof is really nice. But mind that we really use a big black box, namely Honda Tate theory. How do you prove Honda Tate theory? The Honda Tate theory, uh, there's a lot of things which are rather elementary and algebraic and so on and so on and so on. But there's one difficult theorem the difficult theorem says that if you take your uh, ray number, then you can extend your field, your finite field, and you don't know how much. You can take an isogeny, and you don't know how much. And that one can be CM lifted to characteristic zero. So the proof is that you take a CM abelian variety in characteristic zero, which you hope has the correct mod P uh, Newton polygon. And then you have to prove that that really reduces well and so on and so on and so on. So that corrects the zero construction and the whole reduction of P and exactly following what, what the neutral polygon is going to be goes into the Honda Tate theory. And that's the rather difficult thing, right? And here we have a completely elementary proof once you know the theory of displays. So this is a completely different thing and there's no characteristic zero involved here. That gives you the second proof. Um, I have luckily two more minutes, and I'll give you an example. <coughs> and the example is: let me take G arbitrary, but to be sh simple, let's do G is three. But any bigger G also would work. And let's take P to the power. 1 plus 2. And if this g is arbitrary, then you take 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus up to g minus 1. So this is p cubed, but uh, the 3 is 1 plus 2. Right? And I consider A, the moduli space, of dimension g with polarization of degree uh, d squared. And I take of this the super singular locus. And my claim is that this super singular locus contains an irreducible component of dimension equal to three. Yes? Let's suppose I have done this. Then it follows, but you can also compute that if I take T generic, that the A number of my generic fiber is one, and that follows from the construction I'm going to give you, but it also follows from the paper with Norman, right? Then, now you have a strange thing. Um, let xi be 2, 1 plus 1, 2. Yeah? So that's the 
Now the polygons have sloped one third and two thirds length three, right? So this is my new polygon, and this is my other new polygon. And it's slope one third and this slope two thirds. Okay, now I have the following claims. Um, let this A eta be baptized, be zero, and go to some sort of perfect field if you like. Um, there is no B over some S integral such that B uh, zero is A n and a neutral polygon of B generic is xi. Now why is this? You see you know that if I take W xi of A G any D, yeah, xi is this one, that the dimension of every component of this one is three. And that follows from the paper by Norman and myself. So this is a three-dimensional locus. And this three-dimensional locus certainly does not contain T. So the generic point of T is outside this, this locus. So there's no way of deforming this point to a generic fiber where you had a neutral polygon is, is xi, right? But mind the following strange fact that does exist a p-divisible group over some y such and, and, and a point zero yk, such that if you take y zero, that this is isomorphic to b zero p infinity, and the Newton polygon of b generic, of y generic, is, um, is xi. Why is that? Well, that you know because the central fiber has A number one, and today we've proved the Grothendi conjecture for uh, central fibers with A number one. So you can deform Y zero, yeah? So this, so let me finish there. So this shows that if you take W xi open, a, G, D, in the case we have here, and you close it up, it does not contain W, sigma, A, G, D. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your attention, and next week we will go, next story we will go.